Hello, everybody. Hi, Eliza. Nice to see you. I guess I'll, I'll wave too. I'm probably going to have my webcam off for most of it, but hi. <laughs> All right, everybody. The recording has started. We are waiting for one more person to arrive before we get going. But I figured I would start to share my screen. Okay. There you go. Um, so, does anyone have any questions for me before we start? Talk real loud. <laughs> Hey, Sandy, I think we're still hearing the staff meeting through your microphone. Interesting. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. No worries. Thank you. That's that's better. I had actually muted myself because I was wondering if I was interfering with your speech. All right. We are still waiting for one person before we start. Does anyone have any questions? None. Okay. So I will just get started and it's Michael, right? When he comes, we'll just fill him in. Yeah, it's Michael. Yeah, I think go ahead. I haven't heard from him. So yeah. All right. So um, welcome to the training on our basic everyday bicycling workshop. I'm going to talk about a few things in conjunction with this. First, um, how it works to be a workshop uh, leader, how are the philosophy of the everyday bicycling program, and then uh, an overview, and we're going to go over the curriculum itself. Um, if anyone has any questions at any time, I've given you quite a bit of power in this webinar, so for, feel free to interrupt as you see fit. Um, if there's any ambient background noise i may ask you to mute yourself briefly um but it i'm not going to require it right now i prefer there to be some spontaneous interruptions i know this is recorded and we may use this for future trainings but i just hope any future viewers will be forgiving <laughs> of any uh human interactions all right so first let's just talk about um how compensation works because that's really important and that's what everyone is probably really focused on. So we have a model for our trainers which is a flat rate compensation system where if you do an infrequent sporadic sort of or remote event so it could actually be pretty frequent but it's if it's not something we regularly ask people to do or show up for, then this is what, this is the uh, reimbursement model we use. It's a flat rate uh, model. The flat rate for the workshops that Locomotion schedules and asks our leaders to run is $150, no matter how many attendees there are. Um, that's because it's a workshop we've decided is important for our relationships and we generally don't cancel those unless there's no interest. We are not going to send you to a workshop that we know no one's attending. Um, we will cancel those, but that rarely happens. Um, we do have a separate fee rate for if um, one of our leaders makes a connection and sets up a workshop which is great. We absolutely encourage that. Um, 
it's a $15 per attendee up to a total of $150. So um, this way it gives you a leeway to decide whether or not you want to run it. If there are two people and you're like, hey, I could use the 30. <laughs> I'm fine with $30. I mean, that's up to you. Uh, I'm not going to stop you or no one here is going to stop you unless we have a really ex um, extenuating circumstance that would justify that. So any workshops you recruit, you decide whether or not to run and whether or not it's worth it your time. You will have to communicate with the venue that is canceled. Um, that's also your responsibility. So here's the expectations that we ask of our workshop leaders. If you are running an on-bike workshop, which is we're not doing a training for that, that definitely needs to be in person. You need to scout the site beforehand. You need to check out um, a good route that uh, that is both safe and demonstrate some of the principles that you want to cover on the on-street workshop. For example, hill starts, um, managing on-road parking, biking by those, how to handle a left turn and a right turn. Your job is to scout the site beforehand and make sure you have a route that is allows you to teach the course safely and well. For all workshops, obtaining materials for the workshop from the local motion everyday bicycling program manager, and that will be Sandy. She will have you know, materials for you, handouts, um, feedback forms. She'll help you get hooked up. It may just be an electronic format um, that you will get printed and we will reimburse you for printing or um, maybe more easy, we will mail you a packet. Um, I will let Sandy decide what makes sense on a um, situation by situation basis. You need to check in with the on site contact the day before just to double check on attendance, any last minute logistics, um, making sure everything is set and ready, that you know where we're meeting, just to deal with all the stuff that comes up at the last minute because this may be something that's high in your mind but uh, the venue has other priorities and may not be thinking in terms of what is needed to run a smooth workshop you need to arrive on site at least 15 minutes before the workshop to set up and deal with any snafus that will absolutely definitely come up they almost always do ideally it will be a half hour early so you can really deal with stuff Make sure you leave enough time for transit to deal with, you know, all the things that can go wrong on our streets that slow us down. Um, your job is to make sure all the participation, uh, all the participants fill out the feedback form and return them to us. You need to get them to Sandy. Um, 48 hours of the event is ideal. I, we know it's not always possible, especially if you're far flung from us. But we do need everyone to fill out the feedback form. It is actually, um, those forms are what we use to determine attendance, if that is a workshop you've recruited, and if um, also whether or not we're gonna pay you. They're really important. Everyone is well served if those feedback forms are filled out. Um, you will also stay after the workshop, only if you don't have to stay forever, but just enough time to answer any questions someone might have um, afterwards that they were uncomfortable asking in the workshop. And you can provide follow-up support if you choose. This isn't a requirement. Um, it's, it's there to just sort of add an extra layer that you can choose to participate in, but we're not going to make that mandatory. All right, so um, the checklist seems to let me refresh this. Um, this is the checklist that I sent to you earlier. Um, it gives you, you don't have to use the checklist every time, but it's a good review before you start of what kinds of things you want to be doing um, and making sure you're covering, especially if it's been a little while since you last led a workshop. This is a nice refresher. And it even gives you, you know, what to do before, what to bring, what to do during, the main points. Um, 
and and then what to do afterwards. It's really important that you send your invoice to um, uh, both Sandy and Leslie. It um, make sure Leslie gets everything she needs from you, and it um, makes sure that Sandy knows what's also happening. So everyone is on board. Now I had a template for the invoice at one point, but it seems to have disappeared. But an invoice needs your name, your address, the date you worked, the um, what you did, it's like everyday um, bicycling workshop um, at in Morrisville, um, the number of attendees, and um, the amount you're invoicing. And I will send out um, the template I had created. It seems I know it's around. I, I will find it. All right, let's talk a little bit about the Everyday Bicycling Program and the Basic Everyday Bicycling Workshop. So when I first started at Locomotion, the Everyday Bicycling Workshop was actually the Bicycle Commuter Workshop Program, and it focused almost exclusively on uh, biking to work. And as I started working on the program, I started to realize that for a lot of Vermonters, biking to work is a big lift, especially for the kinds of people we're trying to get to ride. Um, I personally live 45 miles away from work. Biking to work would be um, an interesting undertaking to say the least. So we have done a switch to more focus on the low hanging fruit that people don't necessarily think of, but which is also included in transportation. So this is a transportation bicycling workshop, not a um, bike commuting workshop. So the things like you know going to the post office, to maybe the grocery store, maybe you and your kid goes to the playground together instead of driving there, you could walk a bike there. Um, you know, if you tend to go to you know the snack bar. To, for a treat instead of driving you can walk if you drive to work meetings in your you know in the city where you work you can consider walking or biking to those instead so those are shorter trips um, bike commuting works best for um, you know one to five mile trips you now um, around less than a mile it's actually better to walk generally um, so we are we shifted our view from asking people to you know commute in from Essex Junction to Burlington, which is kind of a gnarly trip just in general. It's, there's some pretty messy roads on there, but it's also long. And you know these people that we're trying to engage with, they're not bikers with a capital B. They're you know regular people who are interested in biking, but they're not. Bikers. So their parents, maybe first and foremost, or they have a really demanding job and they just don't have time. So when I lead a workshop, I try to picture the kind of person I'm aiming these workshops at. For the basic everyday bicycling workshop, I'm thinking of somebody I might know personally, like my mother or um, a good friend of mine who is just a regular person who has a lot of other priorities in their lives. They're interested in biking for their own reasons, maybe for health reasons, maybe because they are caring about the environment and they want to make a shift, but they're not necessarily athletes and they're not necessarily skilled or confident bike riders. So just come in and think of somebody, maybe it's you, like for me it was actually me. <laughs> Um, what kind of biking would that person reasonably be willing to do? And what kind of biking is just asking too much? The way we're trying to approach these workshops is um, in the attitude of welcoming, of feasibility, of problem solving. 
um, people will come to you with what you're going to feel like are lame excuses, maybe, um, but they're not. They're, they feel real to the person. They may be genuinely difficult obstacles. And our job is to help people find the possibilities, definitely not dismiss them for their, um, you know, concerns or, you know, because the there is a tendency with the biking community to be a little ableist and a little skewed towards people who've already prioritized biking and it becomes not very inclusive. So our job is to bring inclusivity for everyone back into biking, helping people just find even an easy trip that they can do and just try out. So um, we don't want to set the bars too low, obviously, but we also want to encourage people and welcome them into this new mode of life. Uh, one of our workshop trainers makes a great point of that you need to try something 10 times before you've really worked out the the kinks in it. So he would challenge his attendees to, you know, try biking somewhere 10 times. And by the time they've gotten to the 10th time, they'll know for sure whether they can tweak it to make it work or whether they need um, that it just isn't something that works for them. But he challenges them. He sets them at 10 times. He also would set up, um, right, before you even start, set up your humble brag, <laughs> um, which was, he would say, you know, like, oh, man, I only bike two days this week, you know? So, you know, two days is a big deal. Two days is more than most people do. So if people, you know, then you can sort of uh, go brag. He, it's Peter Burns. Uh, he, he does a great job really welcoming people in. He rides 365 days a year in the winter when he hates it and the summer when he loves it. And he's um, really very realistic about what people are willing to try. All right, so that's the philosophy. Be welcoming, be open, be gentle with people. Um, and really listen when they uh, have an issue or a concern. <clears throat> Pardon me. All right, so this is the packet, the Everyday Bicycling Tips for Everyone. Um, honestly, in my opinion, it could use a rewrite, but it's got some good bones. This is an activity we start out with first. Um, people come to these workshops skeptical but interested. Um, they've taken a big step. They've come to the workshop, uh, but they're not convinced. A lot of them have come in being like, oh, I can't do this, <laughs> or just waiting for you to um, give them a reason that it won't work. So you want to start them off on the right foot by doing a quick exercise with them. Um, have them think of a few places that they drive to during the week. And maybe it's work or daycare, um, playgrounds, post office, whatever. And have them just list, list them. Um, and then after they've filled in those lines, have them think about the stars, um, about the, where the destinations are, how far away they are um, first. So you put a star next to destinations that are a mile or less. Honestly, those are walkable, but you can like them too, honestly, either way. Um, a circle next to destinations that are between a mile and three miles, a square next to three to five, and a triangle next to five to 10. And the way you would run this is you would have people take a few moments to list it. And then when it looks like everyone is done, then find them the you know distance estimates and tell them they're just estimates. If they're just guessing, it's totally fine. They don't need to bust out their phones. And then the next set of instructions is, now think about the routes to take to these destinations. Put a smiley face next to any of these that you feel 90 to 100% confident that you could ride by bike. Put a plus sign next to those that you're more 75 to 90, an at sign next to 50 to 75% confident, and any that are 50% or below, you'll put a pin in it. Those are maybe someday you'll bike there when you're feeling maybe more confident or maybe the route changes or something. But for now, that one's off the list. So now what 
your attendees have is they actually have a concrete idea of places they could go on their bikes. They've already started them with something real they can do. So now they're more willing to listen to the actual workshop. <laughs> all right, so first of all, this is doable. If you have a bike, you're ready to ride. With the only, only a couple of caveats, make sure your bike is tuned up already so it's ready to ride. And then just make sure your bike is safe to ride before you get on it. And it's just a real quick short test called the ABC Quick Check. A is for air. You check your the air on your tire. And the way I do that is I take the flat of my thumb and I push it on the flat part, the part of the tire that touches the road. And my thumb shouldn't go down more than a half an inch. If it goes down more than that, it is seriously underinflated. And you're going to have a really slow, muddy, soupy ride. And it's going to be not fun at all. And also, you'll get a pinch flat. Uh, I've experienced both of those things and they were unpleasant. So definitely remember your air. B stands for brakes. And this one is um, you, what I do is I have people squeeze the front brake and then, you know, try to push their bike forward. That wheel shouldn't turn very much. Squeeze uh, and then let go of the front brake, squeeze the back brake, pull your bike again. This one will move a little bit more because of the way back brakes are but it shouldn't move very much. Your brakes should be functioning. Take your pedal and pedal it backwards unless you have a fixie, which is one of those bikes that breaks when you go backwards, I believe. Um, you can, if you do, and kids have a coaster brake too, kids bikes, they will also break going backwards. And in those cases, you'll have to lift up the back of the bike so that the rear tire is in the air and pedal it or flip the bike upside down. But those are your biggies. You really want to make sure the chain is moving smoothly without grinding or clanking or crunching. Um, if it's making any of those noises, uh, you should definitely figure out why. It may just need lubing, but it also the derailleur may have just gotten off or there could be a more serious problem. If your chain is comes off your bike, your bike is going to um, have some trouble moving again. You can get a chain back on, but if it's been loosened or stretched, you're not going to be able to use the bike. And then there's uh, the quick releases. Just if you've done any removing of your tires or your um, bike seat, make sure those are tight again and that your quick release lever is facing backwards. Um, that way, if you get it caught on something, it doesn't get flipped up. Make sure all those things are tight. Now, one thing that it's easy, it's an easy trap to fall into is the gear. Now, I'm a bit of a gearhead myself. I really love the idea of things you can buy that make the trip more pleasant and fun and efficient. But it can be a real barrier to people who don't have a lot of resources, are only a little bit interested in riding. So you can buy gear. There is gear if you like gear. There's panniers and you know fancy things, all just so oh, goggles and special clothing and this. I mean, walk into a bike store, you will just be presented with all of the amazing options you can choose from, and some of them will be useful. Um, things like um, having uh, uh, fenders on your bike so you don't get mud back splatter. Um, panniers and bike racks are very helpful, but all of these things you can add later. Really, what we want people to do is not feel like they have a bunch of hurdles to come over before they start riding. If you have a backpack to stuff all your stuff into that you're going to take with you, and you have a bike that works and a helmet that fits, you're golden. Just go with that. But some people might be interested in finding other solutions, and they exist. And um, they're fun to talk about, but they are not necessary. And my suggestion would be to hold off any gear discussions until the very end. That way people aren't hearing you say gear isn't important and then hearing you talk a lot about gear right after you say that because they're just going to hear then gear is actually important and now I have to spend a lot of money. So um, just say that. If anyone wants to talk more about gear, tell them we're going to talk about it more at the end of the class. All right, 
So some people have a concern about their ride um, when they say use their bike to go to work, not feeling clean and professional when they uh, arrive there. First of all, take it easy. You don't have to book it. Um, definitely give yourself plenty of time to arrive um, at a nice pace so you can just enjoy the fresh air and see the pretty sights and be relaxed and not stressed, especially for your first few trips. You really don't want to add any extra pressure on yourself. Uh, bring a spare shirt or pack your spare clothes if you are somebody who gets sweaty. Um, I know I am. Uh, so I always, if I'm biking somewhere where I then need to be professional, I put a, just a spare shirt in my bag. So one that I like so that I don't have to worry about, um, I'm sorry, that's the printer. Um, so that I don't have to worry about feeling comfortable when I get there. Um, if you want to bring deodorant, you can. It's not necessary. You um, can also just give yourself a quick sponge down if you need to. Uh, again, this is only if you have a long and sweaty ride and you really feel like you're going to be emotionally impacted by not feeling clean when you get there. You can also make your route shorter by planning a hybrid trip. And you can avoid rushing, and this isn't on the list and I won't add it, by making sure you've packed all your stuff the day before so that you're not running around pulling, trying to find your bike light or your helmet or your lunch and your you know, paperwork for work or whatever you're bringing, your wallet. Um, make sure you have all that at the door. So all you have to do is grab it, maybe pull your lunch out of the fridge and head out so you're not losing time stressing yourself out uh, for, right before you leave. All right, the hybrid trip. These are brilliant. These are an amazing solution for folks who have a long way to ride to where they want to go. Again, you don't have to take a long trip. You can just use your bike for other trips. But if you do want to take a long trip and you're concerned about your ability to get there, you can bike to a bus stop, take the bus, and then ride from the bus stop. Um, this does sometimes run into issues if the bus bike racks are full. Um, some of the buses have room for two bikes. Some of them have a, another, like a side storage that can fit maybe four. Um, I know some people have run into issues where the bike racks have been full and um, that has presented a challenge. So just be aware that can happen. You can also drive to a spot near your destination with your bike on, on a rack on your car and bike the rest of the way from there. I've done that. Um, I've also discovered that if your bike rack is unpleasant to use, you are going to decide not to put your bike on your car. Um, I had, I've had several different types of bike racks in my life. I had a really cheap one with really cheap attachers and it was just, absolutely miserable getting the bike hooked onto the bike rack that I would just decide not to take my bike just because I wasn't in the mood to be made angry <laughs> first thing in the morning. So you definitely want to, if you're going to take that route, make sure your bike rack is, if not a pleasure to use, at least not actively unpleasant. You can carpool with a neighbor and then bike from your neighbor's destination to your own. I've done that. I took um, a, like basically a beater bike and I hit it on my neighbor's work property. And um, I uh, rode my bike from there. It worked great. Um, I was a little bit nervous, but also um, the bike was worked fine, but was pretty ugly. So I wasn't very worried that someone would steal it. Um, so that worked fine. Um, you could just choose to bike one day a week or one day a month, or you can leave your bike at work, for example, and use your for in-town trips. Okay. So there are lots of really good reasons to bike. So we talked about how. Let's talk a little bit about why. It's really a good feeling to ride your bike. It's 
you know, the sun is on your face, usually the wind is in your hair, even with the helmet on, and you see more things, you interact with more things. It is a, it's a much more deeply pleasant trip than riding in a car. Um, you kind of interact with more people. You notice things you definitely wouldn't see when you're in a car, like, you know, swallowtail butterflies fluttering around a flower, or you might actually get a chance to stop and take a look at the heron fishing on the street, or, you know, picking a book up from the little free library along the way. Just a slower, more interesting, more filled with the better experiences of life way to travel than driving a car and um, really worth it. You'll also feel healthier. You'll start your day off or your, your trip off with a little endorphin lift, which is fantastic. And you'll be taking a car off the road. Um, you'll be using less gas and making fewer carbon emissions. And you'll save money. This is um, based on older gas prices, but if you did a 10 mile trip for a 20 mile round trip, it's about $15 a week to, and you'll save $700 a year, which is not an inconsiderable amount of money. Um, and then a, a 30 mile trip is a little excessive to ask of anybody, but some people do it. I know some people do that. Um, you can do, you'll, you can save over $2,000. And as Peter said, if you ride a lot, you can eat a lot. <laughs> uh, you know, the thing that's powering the bike is you and the, the food you eat. All right, so everyone has um, a main concern is being safe. So you need to wear bright visible clothing or you should wear bright visible clothing. I say this, but then I almost never am wearing bright visible clothing, but ideally you would. Um, you need to follow the rules of the road and um, we will have handed folks out um, some flyers, like the Safe Streets brochure about the rules of the road. But the, um, the one thing you really need to think about, there are a lot of rules for people on bikes. Um, some things like don't lock your bike to a tree, to don't hang off the back of a vehicle while biking. Um, both of those are rules and they are good ones. And also, if you have to fill your brain up with information, the ones we really want you to remember are um, ride in the same direction as traffic. That's an important safety consideration. It makes you more predictable. Um, it uh, Physics are your friend to two vehicles with velocity going in the same direction have uh, less impact than two vehicles with velocity coming um, from opposite directions. You'll have much more impact if you crash. Um, use hand signals when you are making turns. I actually use hand signals at at intersections 100% of the time, even going straight, because so few people use hand signals, I like to just let people know what I'm planning on doing, so I will point going straight. Um, you can just point in the direction you're gonna go in. You don't need to use the crooked arm for um, the direction uh, you wanna go to, because it's confusing, it looks like, um, looks like you're waving, actually, so I just point in the direction I'm going. If I'm going left, I point left. If I'm going right, I point right. I don't mess with the other signals. If you want to, you can, but I guarantee you uh, a lot of people driving have completely lost track of what the left arm up and pointing at a right degree, um, right angle means, and they won't understand you. So I just point. I, um, one thing I end up having to do since my right arm, right hand is also the back brake and you really don't want to be letting go of that is I will do a like a kind of intermittent point so I will point and then grab the brake and then point and then grab the brake or I will just wait until I get I will just do one quick point before I get to the stop sign if there's a car behind me and then at the stop sign I will wait and point and make sure everyone knows I also 
this is not necessarily um, uh, what is a lot of people do, but I end up taking the intersection, the middle of the road at an intersection. I don't cut in front of traffic to do that, by the way. I get into line in order. And then um, I am in the middle of the intersection in front of the car behind me, behind the car in front of me. Um, when I get to the intersection itself, I am in the middle of traffic. Everyone who could possibly not see me now sees me. So even if I'm going straight, I tend to take the lane at an intersection. It's a bit of a bending of the rules of the road because they do say right as far to the right as is practicable, but they do give a caveat for safety and I've decided that I get to own that caveat. So um, you need to also use lights at night, front and rear in Burlington, only front and the rest of Vermont, but why not just use front and rear lights? Um, your best bet is to try to get lights that you keep on your bike all the time so you're not um, getting caught out if you are out later than you expected or it's starting to be uh, winter time and getting dark early. You don't want to be caught out at night without your lights. It's not fun. Um, if you're going to ride on the sidewalk, a lot of uh, cities have rules about where you can and cannot ride on the sidewalk. For exa example, in Burlington, the city core is um, not bikeable for adults. Um, teens and kids under 16 can ride everywhere except in sort of the Detroit Street area. Uh, Sidewalk riding is understandable. Um, we don't, we don't, we don't have an official stance against it, but it is actually less safe. Um, cars are not looking for you. They are not expecting you. Um, any infrastructure with the word walk in it is engineered for pedestrians at pedestrian speed. So a sidewalk and a crosswalk are both pedestrian infrastructure designed for people on foot going at the speed a pedestrian can go at. So when, what can happen if you're riding on the sidewalk is somebody is pulling into their driveway, um, your, their view may have been blocked by you know, trash cans waiting for curb pickup or a tree or a bush and they didn't see you. And you have been moving so fast that honestly them seeing you was a, a even reduced likelihood. And also your stopping distance on a, as a person on a bike is much longer than somebody on foot. So, you know, if you're a pedestrian on a sidewalk, you can pretty quickly stop short if someone cuts you off on the road, but uh, turning into their driveway. But when you're on your bike, you don't have that ability. So when you ride on the sidewalk, sometimes you're going to do that just to feel safe. I've ridden on sidewalks. I um, There are a couple of places in the Burlington area that I, I'm just not going to ride on. Um, it, I just don't feel comfortable. Um, Williston Road is one of them. They've made it better. The shoulder's wider now. Um, I might do it now. I haven't been on there since last time I was on there quite a few years ago and absolutely terrified. So I was on the sidewalk then, but I treated every single cut in the road where the cut means where the um, driveways are, where the sidewalk curb has been cut to allow a car through, as though somebody was going to turn in immediately and run me over. So it was a pretty slow ride. Uh, my suggestion for people would be to pick routes that they feel comfortable enough to not need to ride on the sidewalk. Um, you'll do just you'll be just safer across the board on that. Um, um, Mary Catherine, just I just want to chime in on on lights. Um, mm -hmm. Vermont law does require at least a rear reflector, and yes. lots of bikes won't have those, so folks should just get a rear light too. Thank you. Yes. Front light, rear, rear reflector in um, Vermont. And if your bike has lost it or didn't have it, you need to put one on. All right. Um, so again, that pick a, pick a route that feels comfortable. If you are not feeling comfortable and feeling like you need to be on the sidewalk, that route isn't good for you. I was only on the Williston Road because I was um, 
going on a trip I never would have normally taken. And um, I would never repeat that um, because of the way I felt through the whole thing. All right, be predictable. Um, because bikes are nimble and small, um, it's easy to do things on your bike that you couldn't do in a car. And bikes are not cars, and also they are sharing the road with cars. So when a bicyclist is on the road and then just swerves up onto the sidewalk for a little while and then back onto the road, um, maybe to avoid parked cars or whatever the reason is for that, it's not safe. Um, the people in the car feel uncomfortable because they don't know what you're going to do next. You have definitely broken from usual traffic patterns when you, you know, zip around on your bike and do things that are not predictable. Um, you need to signal your turns. You need to ride in a straight line. Um, if um, there are parked cars on the side of the road, you should not be weaving in and out of those because it makes you invisible for a short period of time. You're blocked by the cars. So stay in the same line. If you feel slowing down traffic, um, you'll either, your best bet is to either just sort of grit your teeth and be okay with slowing down traffic or signaling that you're going to get off, um, off the road in the sidewalk and either walking your bike on the sidewalk until that section that you're feeling uncomfortable in has passed or that the line of cars has passed. Um, but don't weave in and out, it's not safe. So pay attention to where cars are in relation to where you are. Um, too many bikers have lost track of where a car is and just turned in front of them. Uh, always check behind you before you turn your bike ever. Make sure there's no car behind you. With you know the hybrid cars especially, very quiet. So you can hear them. Um, me with my hearing impairment actually has a benefit because all cars are like hybrids for me. So I'm just always expecting a vehicle to be sneaking up behind me. I love having a mirror for that very reason. Actually, it helps me um, kind of keep track of who's behind me. I still look, but um, because it is also quite difficult to look behind you while keeping your handlebars straight, um, it's best to save that maneuver for when you feel reasonably sure there isn't actually a car behind you. Um, and in, in order to do that, having a mirror is your best bet. All right, um, scan the road ahead for hazards like potholes and glass or roadkill, anything you don't wanna, wanna run over in your bike. That's, um, if you're scanning ahead, you can plan ahead. You don't want to be surprised by a pothole and feel like you need to swerve and then have there be a car in that right next to you when you make that decision to swerve. So looking ahead for road hazards will keep you safe. You can plan. Um, otherwise, you're going to be uh, struggling. All right. Keep, just in case, keep your emergency contact information with you. This is no different from when if you're driving your car, you keep your emergency contact info with you in your car because crashes happen far more frequently with uh, motor vehicles and they are, um, and you need to have that information in that case as well. So just keep it with you. Um, keep a phone with you just in case. Um, go Vermont, the uh, statewide commuter, program will um, offer people a guaranteed ride home if something goes wrong with their um, alternate commute. So if you took a bus and um, something happened out of your control and you missed your bus, um, you can, they'll, you know, uh, reimburse you for your taxi ride home. They will, they won't pay for it first. You have to get reimbursed. So you actually have, so this is only accessible to people who have you know, enough money to pay for a taxi ride, but they'll reimburse up to $75 of your trip. So if you get a flat on your bike on your way home from work and you need a taxi, again, that's covered. Um, it's a really nice perk, but again, only if you have, you know, $75 in your account. But you just need to 
save the receipt and just write, you know, let them know what happened. All right. Biking builds community. You just, it's just easier to interact with people when you're on your bike. Um, you'll find that you see your neighbors, coworkers, and friends more often on the street. And bike with friends, bike with coworkers. You know, it's a really nice way to talk to people and get to know people better and just get to know your communities better. All right, so the rest of this is just far more detailed versions of the program. Um, you can use it to sort of um, read up on more information. If somebody needs uh, help knowing how to fit their bike so their bike is comfortable, you can you know talk about you know how to cross, stand over the top tube and make sure the bike seat is sort of poking you in you know the very smallest part of your back. Um, your knee shouldn't shouldn't be um, fully extended but slightly bent on the fall down stroke if you're going to be comfortable. Um, it talks about um, you know if you do want to buy a bike, what kind of things you might like. Um, if you, the dual purpose bike is for people who are already bikers, um, that kind of information. Um, it talks a little bit about retrofitting an existing bike and some do's and don'ts and um, whether it's even worth it. Uh, talking about helmet fit, honestly, is a good decision to make. So um, basically what I talk about with um, the helmet, and we can you can put this under safety if you want, is I use what I call the two finger rule. And I am going to turn on my camera so you can see me. Um, all right. So this is the two finger rule. Can anyone see me? I don't see myself. Can anyone see me? I do not see you. Cannot see me. All right, fine. Um, All right, now you're up. So the two finger rule is where you take your two fingers and you hold them flat and you push both fingers against your uh, forehead. That's where the brim of the helmet should be. Um, it shouldn't be any higher than that. Um, you take those same two fingers and put them so they're both up against your chin. You should only be able to get those two fingers um, beneath your chin and the chin strap. You don't want the chin strap so tight that you can't really open your mouth or feel comfortable, but you don't want it uh, so loose that your helmet shifts around all over the place. Take the same two fingers, uh, spread them apart into a V and put them underneath your earlobe. That's the V shape that your ear clip should be. It should be pretty much just a little bit under your earlobe. It should not, the, that, um, the connector of the V should not be above the ear or under the chin. Um, it's not a good fit and contributes to slipping. If you shake your head side to side, the helmet should not shift more than a half an inch when you shake your head. And your helmet should feel comfortable. If it doesn't, then it shouldn't, um, you should get a new one. If a helmet is a single use item. If you crash, it's trash. So, um, there are also expiration dates on helmets. Uh, recent research has shown that um, if a helmet has been stored properly, its um, protective properties do not change. Um, so the expiration date thing, unless you've been just, like freezing it and heating it and dropping it from you know tables over and over again, you can be used that helmet. There's um, an engineering test done on a bunch of helmets of different ages and they tested one from the 70s and it worked fine. So um, I think that's just maybe a way to sell more helmets. But make sure once your helmet has been in a crash, don't use it again, get a new helmet. Don't ever buy a helmet from a garage sale or used because you have absolutely no idea what its provenance is. It could have been in a crash, it could have been owned by like a kid who just likes to throw things around. You just don't know. So always buy your helmets new. Uh, you can get them pretty cheap at Target or Walmart, and they're about ten bucks. So it's it's a pretty reasonable price, right? So um, 
this is just a bunch of really useful stuff for people. I let them sort of just take this um, packet, go home with people, and they can just read more about this stuff if they want. Because um, as you can see, it takes about an hour, and you're going to have a bunch of questions as it is. So um, this is full of pretty useful information. Um, if if you you should read it through it yourself to sort of get an idea of um, the kinds of things people might talk about so you can answer with a little more authority. All right, any questions? Sandy turned her microphone on. Eliza, is anyone talking to me? Uh -oh. No, I wasn't actually talking to you, just turning my microphone on so that I could um, chime in if I had a question, but that felt very thorough. Oh, good. And informative. Good. Thank you. Eliza, you good? Yes, I'm good. Sorry. Yeah, I'm also in the same boat. Don't have any questions. Just have a lot of notes to go over. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Awesome. All right. Well, um, I am cool with ending early. Uh, no one else has any other questions. Thank you all so much for listening to me talk exhaustively at you. <laughs> well, thanks, Mary Catherine. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Bye.